When people visit Detroit and then they come back home, they're often asked the question, so, did you see or hear any gunshots? Better not step in Detroit without a bulletproof vest. Downtown Detroit is actually one of the safest large city downtowns in the country. In this video, you'll see that downtown is home to plenty of entertainment options. You also have several headquarters of major Fortune 500 companies that are located here. You might be asking yourself, if that's true, then why have we seen so many negative headlines about the city over the years? The truth is that Detroit has lots of history and has been through some really tough times. In this video, you'll see how downtown has gotten past some of those hard times, as today, things are a lot better. Unlike my time at the Motor City Casino on the day that I filmed my video on Corktown, I actually won all of my money back at the Greektown Casino. Put me in a good mood on this day, I'll tell you that. Anyway, this will be my sixth video on my Detroit series where I go through the entire city. Obviously, there's a lot of bad in Detroit, but as you'll see in this video, downtown is different. Where I start the video is on the eastern side of downtown, right by the Greektown Casino. Just saw my valet guy from earlier, actually. And if you enjoy this video, make sure to drop a like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already, as doing all of those things helps these videos destroy the evil monster that is the YouTube algorithm. Also make sure to hit that notification bell so that you can be notified every time that I upload a new video. If you enjoyed this video, then you might enjoy checking out some of the featured playlists on this channel. Videos on other places like what you'll see here can be found in my Michigan playlist, my Detroit playlist, or in my large US city downtown playlist. Last but not least, if you can't get enough of me on here, you can always go follow me on my other social media accounts, and those links are below. Oh wait, hold up, what's this? Alright, well, back to scheduled programming. We'll start things off by talking about the history. Obviously, I won't be able to mention everything as that would take an entire Netflix season, but I can mention most of the key moments. And even though downtown Detroit is doing just fine today, we all know that the city has had its struggles, and to understand why these struggles have occurred, you need to know the history, at least in my opinion. So I'll be talking about it for the next 10 minutes or so. Anyway. Detroit was founded in 1701 by Frenchman Antoine de la Mothe Cadillac when he built a fort along what is now the Detroit River. Ever wonder where the name Cadillac came from? There you go. Most of your favorite traditional American car brands came from several historical figures in Detroit. Oh yeah? What about Tesla and Rivian? Those are made in America too. Ah, uh, Detroit isn't the Motor City anymore. I said the traditional American car brands, you know, Cadillac, Chrysler, Ford, Buick, Chevrolet, Pontiac, never mind. Anyway, back to the founding of Detroit, the city's name is a French word for straight and came from the large waterway that connects Lake St. Clair with Lake Erie. Today, that waterway is the Detroit River. The location was considered to be strategic in the 18th century. So strategic that the British didn't fulfill their part of the 1783 Treaty of Paris by giving Detroit to the United States. They refused to until 1976. In 1802, Detroit was incorporated as a village. In 1805, the Michigan Territory was formed and Detroit became the first seat of government for Michigan. In that same year of 1805, Detroit was destroyed completely by a fire. Detroit wasn't very big back then, but it was still a sizable city. Detroit was quick to rebuild, however, and urban planning was led by then-territorial judge Augustus Woodward, which as you can guess is who Woodward Avenue is named after. Woodward created the street layout that we see in downtown Detroit today, as it was very similar to the street layout of Washington, D.C., a city that was also designed by a French-American architect. Woodward's street pattern called for a layout of hub and spoke streets to reflect that of a bicycle wheel. However, it was only downtown Detroit that was built under this style of street pattern, and the plan was abandoned after 11 years. A grid layout was already in place with the agricultural fields that surrounded downtown Detroit, and at that time, that made it nearly impossible to extend the original pattern that Woodward had in mind as the city grew. It did leave us with a unique street layout in downtown Detroit, though, 
And now the Metro Detroit area has the spoke streets that all lead towards Campus Martius Park in downtown. I actually have a playlist put together of Detroit spoke streets if you're interested in seeing those. Going back to the history, the War of 1812 was a big point in Detroit's history as the city was surrendered to the British that year. America was able to recapture Detroit in 1813, and ever since then, Detroit has stayed with the United States. From 1837 to 1847, Detroit was the capital of Michigan before being moved to Lansing. Detroit continued to be a medium-sized city through the late 19th century along the Detroit River, surrounded by agricultural fields. In 1870, Detroit still wasn't one of the ten largest cities in the country, as places like St. Louis, Cincinnati, Baltimore, and New Orleans were still much larger. Beginning around 1870, the auto industry in Detroit came to life. Entrepreneurs like Henry Ford led the way, building the first assembly plant in the world in Highland Park, which allowed mass production of automobiles. Ford's invention allowed these automobiles to be more affordable, as before that, only the true one percenters could afford one. After that, the automobile became extremely popular and it literally changed the world and how society operated. It called for paved roads, bigger streets, parking lots, traffic lights, and many other things. Detroit's assembly plants led the United States Industrial Revolution era and created hundreds of thousands of jobs in Detroit, helping it grow as immigrants and African Americans from the South looked for work to create a better quality of life. By 1920, Detroit became the fourth largest city in the country and it stayed in that spot until 1950, when Los Angeles took over. At its peak in 1950, Detroit was home to 1.8 million residents. A lot has been made about the loss of jobs in the auto industry in this region, and despite the modern-day Tesla not having an economic presence in the metro Detroit area, this region today still has a good portion of the nation's workforce in the auto industry as General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler, now owned by Stellantis, still have their headquarters in southeastern Michigan. By the way, here you can see a newer residential building that's called the City Club Apartments, and this is what the site looked like in July of 2017. Anyway, with a large portion of people working in the auto industry, unions became to be a thing and Detroit was one of the largest unionized cities in the country. These unions made it even more attractive for blacks to move in and work at these assembly plants as it was perceived that the unions would fight for equality and fair wages. In the 1950s and 60s, whites, not only in Detroit but across the country, didn't like black people moving into their neighborhoods and racial tensions are a huge part of Detroit's downfall. Detroit saw a higher rate of blacks from the south moving into the city than other cities did, and this was because Detroit had the most factory jobs available at the time. This created the movement that we call today White Flight, where whites with established families and money would move out of the city and into the suburbs. Let's also not underestimate the role that the automobile had in the White Flight movement. Racial riots first began in Detroit in the early 1940s, and that's around the same time that the city of Detroit started to see a slower population growth rate. The most well-known riots were the 1967 riots, where black residents were upset over a police raid in a black neighborhood. During that, police attempted to arrest 82 different black men, and that caused the week-long riots in a neighborhood on the west side. The riots resulted in 43 lives lost and costed $45 million in property damage. Up here on the left you can see the Motor City Casino which was built in 1999 around the same time that the other two casinos in downtown Detroit opened. Otherwise, this section of downtown is mostly full of parking lots and hopefully that can continue to change over time. However, since the 1950s, the white families with money continued to move out of the city over the years, resulting in the city losing more residents than any other U.S. city since its peak population. Not to mention, middle and upper class black families have also been moving to the suburbs throughout the same time frame. Crime has been an issue in Detroit for decades. For a long time, most of us know that Detroit was considered to be the nation's most dangerous city as the crime rates were leagues above any other major city in the country. 
This was inspired by high rates of poverty, high unemployment rates, and a continuation of lower funding for Detroit's police services, education services, and other city services. Detroit is arguably the most extreme case of segregation that we see in this country, as the suburbs have been thriving for a long time and the inner city continues to struggle. Automotive plants over time started to cut their workforces as well and in some cases completely shut down, which is also a part of the issue. Detroit for a long time was a company town, meaning that the economy revolves around a single company or a single industry. In Detroit's case, it was the auto industry. Today, things economically are a lot better balanced out, but the auto industry still has a huge presence and it likely always will. To the right is the MGM Grand Casino. Detroit is actually the nation's fifth largest gambling market as the industry brings in $1.4 billion during non-pandemic years. That doesn't include the Caesars Casino across the river in Canada, so one could argue that that number should be even higher. Anyways, today, Detroit is much better than it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Even though today Detroit is still seeing population declines, the downtown area has been seeing an economic boom. Downtown used to be full of abandoned skyscrapers and it used to see the same problem with crime that the neighborhoods once saw, but today it's a safe place to have a night out on the town and there's plenty of entertainment options as you've already seen three casinos, you have the four major professional sports teams, even though all four of them currently suck, you have a choice of classic theaters to go see a show at, a nice river walk along the Detroit River. There are hardly any abandoned skyscrapers today as they've all been redeveloped for office space and condos and now we're actually starting to see some new skyscrapers get built, although at extreme turtle speed. More on that later. Outside of the MGM Grand, this area of downtown doesn't have too much excitement. We just passed the Detroit Police Headquarters to the right. Otherwise, it's just law offices and parking lots. More on the economics, downtown Detroit is home to four Fortune 500 companies, those being General Motors, DTE Energy, Rocket Companies, and Ally Financial. Outside of downtown, you have the headquarters of six others, making it 10 total Fortune 500 companies that have their headquarters in Metro Detroit. That's why I always say that looking at the economic stats for Detroit by itself is an incomplete view of the region as a whole, and that goes back to what I was talking about earlier of the city experiencing decades of segregation. Might as well throw in decades of corrupt local officials, but as of the time that I'm uploading this video, the ones running the show today seem to be doing what they can to rebuild the city. Current Mayor Mike Duggan has had approval ratings higher than any other Detroit mayor and is in his third term. This is the Fort Street Presbyterian Church, which was built in 1855 and was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1971. The church is 265 feet tall and is considered to be one of the best examples of Gothic architecture in the United States. It's also one of the tallest churches in the country. From here you can see a view of the Penobscot building which opened in 1928. It consists of 47 stories and rises to a height of 565 feet, 664 feet if you count the antenna. Upon the grand opening of the Penobscot building, it was ranked as the 8th tallest building in the world, which is proof that Detroit was one of America's finest cities back in the day. The name Penobscot comes from a Native American Indian tribe in Maine, and the name Penobscot means the place where the rocks open out. It would make more sense if you were looking at some footage of the Penobscot River in the state of Maine instead of driving footage in downtown Detroit. Anyway, the building is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The Penobscot Building was the tallest building in Detroit until 1977 when the Rensen was completed. However, today, the Penobscot Building is not in the best shape a rarity among Detroit skyscrapers today as most have been renovated quite nicely. An article from the Detroit Free Press that was posted on February 8, 2021 claims that many of the elevators were not working properly and that it had been without running water for a month at the time. Hopefully some rich person can buy it and restore it to its former glory. Dan Gilbert, I'm talking to you since you're the only one with that kind of money who's been doing that kind of thing in Detroit. Meanwhile, we just passed Detroit's main convention center to the right, which opened in 1960. Today, it's still one of the largest convention centers in the United States. 
For a long time, the center was named Kobo Center after a former Detroit mayor, Albert Kobo. In 2019, it was renamed to TCF Center after TCF Bank, and as TCF merged with Huntington National Bank as of 2022, the convention center is now named Huntington Place. The center's biggest annual event is easily the North American International Auto Show, however since 2020 the show has been suspended due to the fears associated with the pandemic. Here you can see a nice view of the Renaissance Center, or as most people say, the Rensen. It's actually a group of seven buildings. Four of the buildings are 39 stories high, rising to 522 feet, while the center tower is the tallest at 73 stories high, rising to 727 feet, putting the center tower as the tallest building in Detroit. Off to the side, you have two separate identical smaller towers that consist of 21 stories and rise to be 339 feet off the ground. A lot of people know of this building as being the headquarters of General Motors, which is ironic as it was Henry Ford II that led the way into building this commercial office complex. His idea was that it would be a massive urban renewal project that would attract people to come back into the city. That didn't really work out the way that it was envisioned, but it did become the most recognizable building in the city. Construction on the main five towers were completed in 1977, and the two extra buildings off to the side were completed in 1981. In 1998, General Motors purchased the building from Ford and made their own renovations to it. Today the first floor is open to the public and there's a nice winter garden space that opens the building up to the riverfront in the back. Sometimes that space will be used to host major events. Most of the rest of the Rensen is office space, however there's a good portion of it that serves as a hotel. To the right is Hart Plaza, which was undergoing renovations at the time that I filmed this video. The plaza opened in 1975 and is thought to be the exact spot where Antoine de la Mothe Cadillac landed in 1701 and founded the original settlement of Detroit. The plaza is named after the former senator, Philip A. Hart. To the right is the U.S. entrance to the Detroit Windsor Tunnel, which opened in 1930. At the time of me uploading this video, it is the second busiest crossing between the U.S. and Canada, only after the nearby Ambassador Bridge. It was the third underwater automobile tunnel in the United States, after the Holland Tunnel in New York and the Posey Tube in Oakland, California. It was the first automobile underwater tunnel that served as an international crossing. And to the right, you can see the streetscape of the Rensen along Jefferson Avenue. Above is the Detroit People Mover, which is an elevated train that is only 2.94 miles long and goes in a loop around downtown Detroit. The People Mover opened in 1987. It's a nice system to use if you're visiting downtown Detroit, especially during the winter months. Maybe you're staying at a hotel and you're only there to see a game, or you're attending the North American International Auto Show. The People Mover can be a nice system to use, but in terms of regional mass transit, the system is an absolute joke. Metro Detroit is the largest metro area in the United States to not have any kind of regional mass transit. Well now is as good of a time as any to talk about Dan Gilbert, as I'll be referencing this guy throughout the rest of this video. You can't really explain to someone what's been happening economically in downtown Detroit without mentioning Gilbert. He is more so known on a national scale as being the founder of Quicken Loans, America's largest mortgage company, and for being the owner of the NBA's Cleveland Cavaliers. Gilbert lives in the Detroit suburbs and does the majority of his business in the Detroit and Cleveland areas. He's thought to be one of the top 50 wealthiest people in the world. Gilbert has had his controversies in the sports and business worlds, most notably his letter to LeBron James when James announced that he was leaving his hometown Cleveland Cavaliers for the Miami 
Miami Heat back in 2010. On notes that are more relevant to this video, however, in 2010, Gilbert moved his company, Quicken Loans, from the Detroit suburb of Livonia into downtown. Since then, Gilbert and his real estate company, Bedrock, owns quite a few buildings in downtown. Too many to name here as it's over 100 properties. Over time, Gilbert has invested over $5.6 billion to help revitalize the downtown area, and we've seen numerous skyscrapers and other important buildings of historical note in downtown Detroit get revitalized under his money. We're actually starting to see Gilbert purchase large properties outside of downtown. Honestly though, that's what it was going to take, no matter what, to revitalize downtown Detroit. Money, money, and more money. Downtown Detroit is in a great spot today as it continues to attract new companies, residents, and businesses. However, it's going to take even more money and effort to fix up the rest of the city's poverty-stricken neighborhoods, but you can check out those other parts of the city by clicking through the videos in my Detroit playlist. Between Atwater Street and the Detroit River to the left is the Detroit Riverwalk, an asset that the city has worked hard to make nice over the last 10 years or so. Currently, the Riverwalk is three and a half miles long. For whatever it's worth, in 2021, USA Today ranked Detroit as having the best Riverwalk in the country. While we have a few minutes to squeeze this talking point in, I'm going to give some context behind the Detroit bankruptcy and why it happened. The reason why you keep hearing that Detroit is a comeback city in recent news articles is because it is. At one point, there was no direction to go but up, as the city was at rock bottom from a fiscal standpoint. For this, I'll give the example of ex-Detroit Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick, whose actions helped the city go bankrupt in 2013. Granted, Detroit has had years of corruption before Kilpatrick took office, but that would take forever to talk about. And it would take forever to talk about everything Kilpatrick has done as well. Anyway, Kilpatrick began his quest of killing the city's finances after being elected mayor in 2001 at the age of 31. Kilpatrick stayed in office until 2008, however shortly after being elected, Kilpatrick used lines of credit that were issued to the city of Detroit for new cars, spa massages, and luxury dining, among many other things. Plenty of others who were in city leadership positions under Kilpatrick's watch were charged with variations of corruption as well. On top of all that, Kilpatrick even had an affair with a member of his staff. Kilpatrick alone was convicted on 24 different felony counts, and in October of 2013, he was sentenced to 28 years in prison. For whatever it's worth, in 2021, his sentence was commuted by Donald Trump. I've driven past this, but I haven't talked about it much. The Greektown Casino was opened in the year 2000 in Detroit's Greektown district. Greektown is incredibly small and only consists of several blocks along Monroe Street, and we'll drive through it along Monroe Street later. Greektown today serves as downtown's place to go if you're looking for some nightlife. Originally, the building that the casino sits in today was owned by a fur trapper, and the building was used to process fur. In 1985, the building was made into a five-story indoor shopping mall which was called Trapper's Alley. Today, much of the building has architectural elements that remain from the time that it was a shopping mall, inside and out. In 2007, the blue shiny glass 400 room hotel was built, and in 2008, the casino portion expanded. The first owners of the Greektown Casino were the Sault Ste. Marie Chippewa tribe who held 90%. By the way, if you want to see a video on Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, that's somewhere that I've made a video on already, and it can be found in my Michigan playlist. Anyway, the casino and hotel went bankrupt in 2013 and it was purchased by no one other than Dan Gilbert. Gilbert tried to rename the complex to Jack Detroit Casino Hotel Greektown, as he owned the company branded as Jack Entertainment, but the name change attempt failed. In 2018, Gilbert sold the casino to New York City-based Vici Properties. And right past the Greektown Casino, you have the Wayne County Juvenile Facility and the Wayne County Jail. Don't want to end up here when you visit.
Just don't be like the guys from The Hangover while you're having your night out on the town at one of the casinos and you should be fine. Just past the juvenile facility on the right is what many locals refer to as the Fail Jail Site. It's a 14-acre site that Wayne County began to build a new jail on back in 2011. In 2013, the project came to an end even though construction had already started. Since then, multiple different projects have been proposed for the site. In 2016, Gilbert along with the Detroit Pistons owner Tom Gores proposed a 25,000-seat Major League Soccer Stadium. That didn't pan out. and in in early 2017, Gilbert offered to build a new jail away from downtown in exchange for the site. In 2018, a deal was made where Gilbert and his company would build a new jail away from downtown and Gilbert would own the rights to the failed jail property. Also in 2018, the old half-built jail was demolished and in 2019, Gilbert along with developer Stephen Ross announced a plan with the University of Michigan to build the Detroit Center for Innovation. However, shortly after that, the pandemic came about and everything started to shut down and that was a time that everybody everywhere was backing out of their real estate development plans as everyone was scared about where the economy was heading and as of today, Ross has backed out of that plan and all we know is that Bedrock says that they will build build a comprehensive innovation district on the site, so basically there are no serious plans to develop anything there currently. To the left is Ford Field, home to the disaster that is the Detroit Lions. In 2002, the Lions began to play their home games in downtown, moving away from the Pontiac Silverdome, which is 30 miles north. As was often the case during this era, with a brand new stadium came the chance for a city to host a Super Bowl, and Detroit was able to do so in February of 2006. The event was nothing like what downtown Detroit had seen in decades as the city continued a steep economic decline. Like many professional sports stadiums and arenas, Ford Field often hosts other major entertainment and sports events throughout the year. Straight ahead is Comerica Park, and you can see that the streets are blocked off as the game was going on while I filmed this video. Comerica Park is named after Comerica Bank, which used to have their headquarters in downtown Detroit before moving to Dallas in 2007. Comerica Park replaced the old Tiger Stadium as being home to the Tigers in the year 2000. Many people say that the opening of Comerica Park began the momentum that downtown Detroit needed to revitalize as it opened shortly before the neighboring Ford Field did. And right by Ford Field in Comerica Park is the newer Little Caesars Arena. Little Caesars Arena opened in 2017 and became home to the Detroit Pistons and the Detroit Red Wings. Previously, the Red Wings played at the Joe Louis Arena along the Detroit River, and the Pistons played at the Palace of Auburn Hills, which wasn't that far away from the Pontiac Silverdome, 30 miles north of downtown Detroit. Like most arenas of Little Caesars size, the venue hosts many different types of events throughout the year. Today it's one of only five NBA arenas to be capable of holding over 20,000 fans. More on the state of professional sports in Detroit in a few minutes, as straight ahead to the right is the Fox Theater. The theater opened in 1928 and was considered to be one of the top theaters for concerts, movies, and performances in the country at the time. In 1987, the theater was in need of renovations and it was purchased by the Illich family which owns the Tigers and the Red Wings. We can talk more about the Illiches later. The theater reopened in 1988 after the renovations and in 1989, the Fox was designated as a National Historic Landmark. Today the theater is back to hosting events on a regular basis during non-pandemic years. This part of downtown is what the city wants you to call the District Detroit. It's supposed to be anchored by a home arena or stadium for all of the four major professional sports teams, the Fox Theater and the neighboring Fillmore Theater. The district is supposed to be a 50 block area that surrounds the new arena and it was supposed to have new apartments, condos, shops and businesses, but hardly anything has been done outside of the opening of the new arena. Most of the land in the district is owned by the Illiches already and any time that they're asked about the lack of progress, they get defensive with the media, so who knows if it will ever become to be a thing. Most of the district Detroit is actually in Midtown. There's been multiple local media outlets that have made stories on the matter, and there was even an HBO documentary on it as so much hype was made back in 2017 about renovations and an exciting new urban district being built that would be mostly completed by 2022. 
but hardly any work has been done, leaving many disappointed. Shame on you, Illich family. Too busy trying to promote their cheap hot and readies to the world instead of doing what they promised in their hometown city. But hey, at least the new Little Caesars headquarters has pizza-shaped glass windows. Yay! <laughs> Alright, I'm being mean now. Maybe it's a good thing, though, that work isn't happening as quickly as promised. I mean, the idea for the District Detroit was centered around the new arena that's home to the Red Wings and the Pistons. Nearby, you have the Tigers and the Lions. I mean, let's face it, professional sports in Detroit right now are the saddest violin song in the United States sports world. The Pistons have failed to win a playoff game since 2008, the Lions haven't won a playoff game since 1992, and in all of professional sports, only the Cincinnati Bengals are worse as they haven't won a playoff game since 1991. However, at the time of me uploading this video, they could very well possibly change that this upcoming weekend when they play the Raiders. If the Bengals win, then the Detroit Lions are officially in a league of their own. In fact, many Lions fans have been spotted throughout the years at home games wearing paper bags as hats to show their embarrassment of rooting for such a pathetic team over the years. The Lions became the first team to go 0-16 in the NFL back in 2008, and many thought that they would be the first 0-17 team this past season as the NFL added an extra game to their regular season schedule. The Tigers were able to see some success from around 2006 to 2014 when they were considered to have the best bullpen in all of baseball, but those teams could never find a way to get over the final hump. The team made two World Series appearances, one in 2006 when they lost to the Cardinals and another in 2012 when they lost to the Giants. However, since 2014, the Tigers have been one of the worst teams in all of the major leagues as they haven't seen a single postseason appearance. For the Red Wings, after winning four Stanley Cups from the mid-90s to the mid-2000s, they haven't made a playoff appearance since 2016. But hey, at least downtown Detroit has nice, modern, new stadiums and arenas to host all of their sports teams. With all of that said, I think it's accurate to say that Detroit has been the most losing sports city over the past decade. Yeah, y'all haven't done squat. Not even Blake Griffin could help the Pistons win a single playoff game. Yeah, y'all stink. Who are you to come into our city and diss our sports teams? Either support our teams or get out. Detroit versus everybody. Look, I'm sure that one day people will be able to look back at this video and say, Oh, Chris's comments didn't age well, as the Pistons somehow win a playoff series, or maybe the Lions are finally able to win a playoff game, but as of right now, yeah, all of Detroit's teams stink. In all honesty though, if one of these teams, or if several of them, could go on multi-year runs of being great, that might help the city further their momentum in their economic recovery efforts. Meanwhile, now we're on Woodward Avenue, which is the heart of downtown, and it's where a lot of the excitement happens. There's hardly a vacant storefront as the street is full of shops and businesses. As you can see, most of this stretch of Woodward is retail. It's always been this way, as back in Detroit's glory days, the biggest retail store in downtown was the JL Hudson Building which first opened in 1911 at the corner of Woodward and Farmer. I know that some Detroit history nerd will call me out in the comments and say something like, You obviously didn't do your research. Hudson's first had a building on the site in 1891 after owning their first store inside the Detroit Opera House in 1881. Even though I wasn't wrong with what I said, as the building that most of us remember was first opened in 1911, and if I added all that, I'm just going to confuse everybody. I also can't be that specific on everything because then the video would be two hours long and nobody would click on this video. Anyway, moving on now, expansions were made to the original building over time, and in 1946, the building was completed at 439 feet tall. At the time, it was the tallest department store in the world, as it was the flagship store for the massive Hudson's retail chain. However, in 1954, a new shopping center opened in the Detroit suburb of Southfield, which at the time was the largest shopping center in the world. The new JL Hudson store in Southfield took away much of the business from the downtown store. As economic decline continued in downtown Detroit, Hudson's moved their headquarters to Minneapolis in 1969. 
The company considered closing the massive downtown Detroit store as early as 1971, and in 1983, the downtown location finally closed. Many people consider the 80s and the 90s as being the worst times economically for downtown Detroit. In 1996, the iconic Hudson's building was demolished, and at the time, it was the tallest building in the world to ever be demolished. Side note, as there's probably some people watching this video that don't know what Hudson's was, it was a massive retail chain that closed all of their locations in 2001, and if you're too young like I am to remember those stores, you can think of Hudson's as being on the same level as Macy's back in the day where you could bet on seeing one in pretty much every shopping mall. Today, the Hudson site is the location of Detroit's newest skyscraper, the biggest project that downtown has seen in years, even though it's being built at extreme turtle speed. The ground was broken in 2017, and construction started on a pair of towers that are currently being built on the site. The project is being developed by Gilbert and his real estate firm Bedrock. Initially, the tallest of the two towers was going to be 912 feet tall, making it the tallest building in Detroit, with an observation deck on top. After a year of construction, however, word came out that the tower was no longer going to be the tallest building in Detroit upon completion, and instead, it was going to be 685 feet tall. <coughs> That's because construction costs were going to be more expensive than they originally thought. What's really funny though is that Bedrock's official website still claims the rather. I also remember how proud Gilbert was to be bragging about how tall his tower was going to be at first. Well anyway, after that announcement, the pandemic shutdowns came to be a thing, which allowed everyone to use that as an excuse if they wished, for delayed projects, for laying people off, for closing down their stores, whatever the case may be. So now we're still sitting here in 2022 waiting on the building to shape up when it was supposed to be done this year. And yes, I'm aware that this footage was filmed six months before I'm uploading this video to YouTube, and more progress has been made, but that's not the point. Now it's supposed to take until 2024 before the building is finished. But hey, at least we know that this building will get done, because downtown Detroit has been notorious over the years for investors announcing exciting new projects time and time again, only to announce that the project has been cancelled for whatever the reason might be. So it's good to see these projects getting done now. Well, moving on now, this is Campus Martius, which is considered to be the center of downtown Detroit. It's known as the city's gathering place. With that, a lot of events are held here. During the winter months, an ice skating rink opens up at the park. In 2021, USA Today named Campus Martius as the top public square in the country, for whatever that's worth. Other things about Campus Martius includes that this is where Detroit's point of origin was in Augustus Woodward's plan to build the city. If you've ever wondered why 8 Mile Road is called 8 Mile Road, it's because it's located 8 miles due north of Campus Martius. On this final stretch of Woodward Avenue, you'll notice that the road comes to an end at Larned instead of Jefferson. In 2019, the final block of Woodward between Larned and Jefferson was closed off to create the Spirit of Detroit Plaza. You also have a pair of some of Detroit's more recognizable buildings on either side of the road, one of them being the taller and newer Ally Detroit Center, and the other being the older, yet ritzier Guardian Building. The Guardian building is even more impressive on the inside with its architectural details. The building opened in 1929 and stands at 496 feet tall. In 1989, the building was listed as a National Historic Landmark. It's considered to be one of the more significant Art Deco styled skyscrapers in the world, and today, it remains as one of the tallest brick buildings in the world. 
Since this is one of the more recognizable pieces of artwork in downtown Detroit, here is a closer look at the spirit of Detroit. The statue was completed back in 1958. Not far from it is the Joe Louis Fist, which is in the median of Jefferson Avenue, where it used to intersect with Woodward Avenue. The Joe Louis Fist was completed in 1986 to honor the late professional boxer from Detroit. Up ahead is the Millinder Center, which is a two-building complex that was completed in 1985. Half of the building is a hotel, while the other half is an apartment complex. Otherwise, the name of the street that we're on comes from Charles Larned, who fought in the War of 1812 and was an attorney general for the Michigan Territory. Well, now it's time to talk about another big part of Detroit's history, and that is the music. There's many genres of music that have a significant history here, and we'll start with jazz. Some of the jazz musicians of note include Alice Coltrane, Milt Jackson, and Louis Hayes. Most people have heard of Motown Records, where artists back in the day, such as Stevie Wonder, Barry Gordy, Martha Reeves, Diana Ross, Smokey Robinson, and Jackie Wilson made their music talents known through the Motown label. Today, Motown Records are based out of Los Angeles, which is just criminal, but there is the Motown Museum that is still here off of West Grand Boulevard. Anyway, several blues artists made their mark here as well, including Sonny Boy Williamson II, Washboard Willie, Eddie Kirkland, Bobo Jenkins, and John Lee Hooker. When it comes to rock and roll, Detroit has inspired many songs in the genre throughout the mid-20th century, as you'll often hear many popular songs mention the city. However, among the rock and roll artists that are from Detroit include Bob Seger, Ted Nugent, and Alice Cooper. Other popular music artists that have played a big role in Detroit's music scene include Madonna and Aretha Franklin. Speaking of music, to the right is St. Andrew's Hall. The basement of the building has a stage that is known as The Shelter, which is mostly known for being the starting point for Eminem's career. He highlights it in his movie 8 Mile. Moving on now, this is the Wayne County Building, which opened in 1902 as the Wayne County Courthouse. In 2009, the county moved all of their offices out of the building, and in 2014, the county sold the building to an investment group that plans on making it residential. And I guess that we'll just have to wait and see what happens to it. In 1975, the building was put on the National Register of Historic Places. Meanwhile, this street offers a good view of the Guardian building ahead on the left. While we continue on Congress, one thing that I can mention is the Detroit Grand Prix, which is an IndyCar race that is held in Detroit. The race has been held off and on since 1989, after the weekend of the Indy 500 race in Indianapolis. The race has been held on Belle Isle since 1992, but in 2003 the plan is to make the race go through the streets of downtown Detroit circling the Renaissance Center. Here is a street-level view of the Guardian building from Congress for whatever it's worth, as there's a car parked in front of it. You'll see a plaque that says Wayne County, and that's because the county moved their offices from the old Wayne County building into the Guardian building back in 2009. We are now in the historic financial district of Detroit, which is bounded by Woodward, Jefferson, Lafayette, and Washington. The district includes 33 buildings, and it's named as such, as much of the office space in the financial district historically has been used by banks. As this part of downtown was mainly the heart of downtown from the mid-19th century all the way to the 1970s, a good chunk of the city's skyline is made up of older skyscrapers that lie within the district, which brings me back to the likes of the Guardian Building and the Penobscot Building being the two that stand out. And here on the left, you can see downtown's convention center with the electronic signage, and I talked about the center earlier in the video. Once again, it's called Huntington Place Today, even though for the last couple of years it's been called TCF Center, and it was called Kobo Center for a very long time before that.
And here is the view of Detroit's financial district from Fort Street. I actually have a video of Fort Street where I drive the road in its entirety from the downriver suburbs all the way into downtown, so make sure to check out my Detroit Spoke Streets playlist if you're interested in that. Meanwhile, up ahead is another historic district, and this is the Washington Boulevard Historic District, which was listed as such in 1982. The district consists of all of the buildings off of Washington between State and Clifford Streets. The district is complemented by a grassy landscaped median along Washington Boulevard, and among the more notable buildings includes the Book Tower, which stands at 463 feet tall. Today, the Book Tower is Gilbert's latest downtown renovation investment, and it's set to open late in 2022 as an extended stay hotel among other commercial uses. The Book Tower is a significant historical marker for the city of Detroit as the tower first opened in 1926 and upon completion it was the tallest building in Detroit. As we continue to see the streetscapes alongside Washington Boulevard, I'll mention the Detroit Free Press Marathon as I have some time to kill. The Detroit Free Press Marathon has been in place since 1978, and the course goes through Canada as well. Runners will start in Detroit, run across the Ambassador Bridge, and then back into Detroit through the Detroit Windsor Tunnel. In 2020, the marathon didn't go due to the pandemic. To the left you can see the new City Club apartments that have just recently opened and I highlighted it earlier in the video when I passed by on Clifford Street. Straight ahead is Grand Circus Park, which is shaped as a half circle. The park was created based off of the street layout design that Augustus Woodward had in mind when rebuilding the city from the fire. The area surrounding Grand Circus Park is actually another historic district that was officially added to the National Register in 1983. Some of the more significant buildings that are a part of the district include the Detroit Opera House, the David Whitney Building, and the David Broderick Tower. To the right is the Madison Theater Building which opened in 1917 and was the first major theater to open in downtown Detroit. It was the first theater in Michigan to show a full-length talking picture, which was the Jazz Singer on Christmas Day, 1927. For a while, Grand Circus Park was the main shopping and entertainment area of downtown, with the Madison Theater being the center of all the action. The theater wasn't able to last as the theater portion of the building was demolished in the early 2000s and today, the building is owned by, of course, Gilbert and his real estate firm, Bedrock. Inside are the offices of several tech companies, including Twitter. To the left, we just passed the Detroit Opera House, which opened in 1922 and was renovated in 1996. Originally, it was actually known as the Capitol Theater, and upon opening, it was the fifth largest movie theater in the world, as it sat 3,500 people. However, since 1988, the building has been known as the Detroit Opera House.
Earlier I talked about the Greektown Casino, which is easily the most popular place to go in Greektown, but the street is lined with other popular bars and restaurants along both sides of the street. Greektown is a historic district and it consists of only a few blocks. As you can imagine, historically, this is where Greek residents originally settled in Detroit. In the 1920s, the Greeks began to move out of the area, however, most of them kept their shops and businesses along Monroe Street. The district began to commercialize in the 1960s, and earlier I mentioned how the casino used to be a shopping mall in the 1980s. Since around that time, Greektown has served as a popular place for food and entertainment. And since we've already seen the streets that I drive on for the next few minutes, I do skip the video ahead to a part that we haven't yet seen, where I head southwest on Gratiot Avenue towards the center of downtown. Another event that Detroit is known for that I can mention here is America's Thanksgiving Day Parade. The parade route is along Woodward Avenue through Midtown and Downtown. The parade began in 1924 and was sponsored originally by the JL Hudson Company. Given the fact that Detroit used to be the fourth largest city in the country, the parade has significant traditional value. It's tied with New York City as having the second oldest Thanksgiving Day Parade in the country, only to the Thanksgiving Day Parade that's held in Philadelphia. Even though Detroit isn't considered to be one of the largest cities in America anymore, Detroit's annual Thanksgiving Day Parade is still one of the top five largest that are held in the country every year. To the right is another view of the Hudson site, where once again, Detroit's newest skyscraper is expected to be built and completed by the end of 2024 at a height of 685 feet. To the right is Capitol Park, and the small district that surrounds it was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1999. The park has the shape of a triangle due to the street layout, and the name comes from the first Michigan State Capitol building, which was built here in 1828. The building remained here until 1893, when a fire destroyed it, and at that point the land was made into a park. About 10 years ago, most of the buildings that surround Capitol Park were empty, but today the space is full of active storefronts with offices and condos being used in the upper levels. The park itself has also seen a facelift. Capitol Park used to be used as downtown's transit center for the city and regional buses as they had nowhere else to go. Today up ahead you can see the top of the newer Rosa Parks Transit Center, which opened in 2009. Moving the main bus stop into its own designated spot in downtown Detroit has helped Capitol Park redevelop into what we see there today. Anyway, today the Rosa Parks Transit Center serves as the downtown connector for the fast bus that goes to the airport and the smart bus system that goes to the suburbs. Public buses are the only form of mass transit that Metro Detroit has today, which brings me to mention, once again, that Metro Detroit is the largest metro area in the country without a regional mass transit rail line. 
Otherwise, this area of downtown has much more parking lots than it has buildings, and there's much more excitement to be had in pretty much every other part of downtown. Hopefully over time, these parking lots can turn into new buildings. And this is Michigan Avenue, one of the main spoke streets for downtown as it heads towards Campus Martius. One of the main food options in not only Detroit, but Metro Detroit, is a Coney Island hot dog. The region is littered with Coney Island restaurants, and to the right are two of the most well-known places of that kind, the Lafayette Coney Island and the American Coney Island. The Coney Island hot dog was actually first made in the Michigan city of Jackson, which is a little bit over an hour's drive west of Detroit. With that said, the two restaurants in downtown Detroit are the ones that are thought to be the original restaurants for the Coney Island hot dog. Both restaurants have often been featured in popular food and travel shows. Another thing that I haven't been able to mention until now is yet another new skyscraper project that is supposedly in the works for downtown Detroit. On the other side of Campus Martius, at the corner of Monroe Street and Woodward, is the site of what is eventually going to be the Monroe Blocks, and the project is being run by nobody other than Dan Gilbert and his real estate firm, Bedrock. Back in 2018, ground was broken to make way for a new high-rise mixed-use building, with the lower floors offering variations of shopping and dining. However, the project is on a temporary stall, and who knows when work will be done to build the rest of the project, or if it will even happen at this point. According to Bedrock, the main reason why the project is on hold is because of uncertainties that have been amplified during the COVID-19 pandemic. The office tower portion of the project was expected to be 536 feet tall, with the residential tower being 335 feet tall. Whether the project ever gets done or not is anybody's guess, and if I were to give my honest opinion, I would say that it's not going to get built. Hopefully I'm wrong. Meanwhile, this is Cadillac Square, which is often closed off to vehicle traffic during events when they're held at Campus Martius Park, and the closure allows Cadillac Square to be used as sort of an extension of Campus Martius when it's busy. To the right is what is left of the historic National Theater. It's not only the oldest surviving Detroit theater, but it's the only original building along Monroe Street that is left. The theater opened in 1911 with 800 seats, and around 1920, the National started to show motion pictures to compete with the nearby Madison Theater. Shortly afterwards, the theater transitioned to having live orchestra performances. 
However, in the 1960s, the theater was known for its burlesque performances, and then in the 70s, it was showing X-rated content. At that point, the area surrounding the National Theater along Monroe Street was dying, as was the rest of downtown Detroit. In 1975, the theater closed, and in the 90s, all of the buildings that were original to Monroe Street were demolished, while the theater was the only one left. The theater today is owned by nobody other than Dan Gilbert and his real estate firm, Bedrock, and the plans are to save the theater through renovations. The area between the Renaissance Center and Greektown is what the city would like you to call Bricktown, but there isn't much to it other than a few parking lots. Otherwise, between Greektown and Comerica Park, Brush Street has a few nice restaurants off of it. To the left here you can see a nice mural that pays tribute to Stevie Wonder and the Motown music culture. And here you can see a crowd leaving the Tigers game that was being played on this day. And the Tigers actually won this one, surprisingly. They beat the Twins, another awful team. And obviously I wanted to go straight, but I couldn't as police were blocking off traffic due to the crowd leaving the game. So I had to turn right. In this video, you saw nearly everything in downtown Detroit, and hopefully you were able to learn about the place. Now, I'm sure the comments section will quickly fill up with a few things that I missed and add something like, He's clearly not from here as he never showed the Joe Louis Arena site. Don't listen to this guy. To that, I'll just say that unless you want a three-hour video, it's impossible to mention and show everything of note in downtown Detroit. Anyway, it's clear that Detroit is rich in history and has made many improvements over the last 10 to 20 years. Today, it's a great place to spend a night out on the town. Hopefully the sports teams can turn it around soon so it can be worthwhile to buy tickets to a game. And contrary to popular belief, downtown is also an employment hub as it's home to some major company headquarters and you wouldn't know that by looking up your typical article where lazy journalists who work for places like USA Today will sometimes still call downtown Detroit dead. Anyways, I do end the video here, and if you enjoyed this video, make sure to drop a like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already, and you can always find other videos like what you saw here through my Detroit playlist, my USA Large City Downtowns playlist, or in my Michigan playlist. Make sure to go follow me on my other social media accounts as well if you can't get enough of me on here, and those links are below. We'll see you next time. Peace!